Welcome everyone. My name is David Hemig. I'm with Matheson. And with me today are folks from engineering, marketing, and production. And at the end of this webinar, Bill Staples, our senior engineering manager, will be with us to answer the questions that you submitted prior to this webinar today and questions that you submit during this webinar. To submit questions, just use the GoToMeeting toolbar and send a question over. And at the very end of this, we will answer it. Okay, let's begin. First thing I wanna stress is that the items I will discuss today, the equipment we make that help keep you safe, is all manufactured in Montgomeryville, Pennsylvania, in the United States of America. Gases are dangerous. You likely know that, and that's why you're here joining us. You need to know the properties of the gas. The pressure, higher the pressure, the higher, higher the potential for damage if something should go wrong. Is your gas toxic? Meaning, if you're exposed to it, will it make you ill or maybe even kill you? Is it corrosive and will degrade your system, causing a leak? and spill out into the environment? Is it flammable? Meaning, is it gonna burn? Hydrophoric, meaning it may burn right away upon contact with air, or it may wait a little bit, collect, and then combust. And then you get an explosion. Or is it an oxidizer? An oxidizer is gonna make a fire burn hotter and faster. You don't know the properties of all the gases you're dealing with, you need to review the safety data sheet and you should have a safety data sheet for every gas in your facility. If you need some, go to this link right here and you can get all the data sheets you need. All right, I wanted to point out that the reason cylinders are high pressure is because you're cramming a larger volume of content into a smaller space. Here, a standard cylinder, roughly four foot high cylinder, will hold 225 cubic feet of gas. And we're gonna cram that in a space of 1.5 cubic feet. That's 225 is 150 times 1.5. So that's how you get pressure within the cylinder vessel. So that high pressure cylinder has a stored energy equivalent of one pound of dynamite. Think about that. That's really what you have in your facility, is something that has as much energy as a pound of dynamite. So gases that leak are gonna spill out into the environment. Here is a chlorine leak. It's basically a corrosive gas. It's, it's degraded the system and now it's spilling out. Chlorine is only uh, it's slightly less than 100 PSI. And look at what it's doing to the space. Higher pressure gases are gonna spill out even faster and saturate an area quicker. You need to keep control of your cylinder. Here's a picture of a gentleman losing control. You can see he's got a cart that's got a flimsy chain. He's only got two wheels down here. And this cylinder is tipping forward. If this cylinder valve area right here were to hit a ledge or rock or curb and rupture, that cylinder's gonna spin, it's gonna travel on the floor and maybe go airborne. So what are we gonna accomplish today? We're gonna le learn about specialty gas equipment that helps you handle hazardous gases safely. And we're gonna learn about resources and support we have available to assist you. So our rule number one, protect your eyes. Think about it, you've got a high pressure gas. You get a leak out of your system or cylinder. Well, the gas of course could be problematic coming into contact with your skin, your eyes, but also particulates on the bench top, on the floor, in the air, they will be pushed into your eyes like little bullets. 
So think about that when you're dealing with a compressed gas. Protect your eyes. Regulators. Here's an example of a regulator that's obviously is past its prime. If you have a regulator where you can't work with the gauges, you see rust, you see corrosion, you see obvious problems with the health of that regulator, don't use it, retire it, replace it. Now, regulators are a key part of any gas handling system, but that's not what this the focus of this webinar is. But if you'd like to learn more about regulators, go to that QR code there. It's our YouTube channel, and you will see a whole webinar on pressure regulators. I think you'll find that valuable. All right, we wanna talk about the cross purge assembly. The cross purge assembly has a great reputation for helping to maintain the purity of a system, keeping moisture and particulates and hydrocarbons and other impurities out of your system. But here, I wanna focus on the safety element of it. So this cross purge assembly right here with the regulator, here's your regulator coming off the outlet of the cross purge. Your cylinder is gonna be right here. Cylinder valve is right here. So when it comes time to change that cylinder and you've got a hazardous gas here, like phosphine, arsine, chlorine, hydrogen chloride, any of those gases that you cannot be exposed to without incurring a health issue, you need to clean that out of this space before you do the cylinder change out. And the way you do that is you bring your nitrogen in through the purge gas inlet valve. You fill this space. This valve is gonna be closed. So you're gonna fill it and then you're gonna evacuate. Of course, before you do that, you're gonna close your cylinder valve, but you're gonna fill and evacuate multiple times depending upon the gas. Once you clean that hazardous gas out of there, now you're going to run a nitrogen bleed out your CGA with this valve closed. Do your cylinder on, close this valve, keep this valve closed, send a couple slugs out your vent, close your vent, and now you're running your process gas downstream to your point of use. That's how you use the, use the cross purge, and the cycle purging gets that hazardous gas that you cannot be exposed to out of there before you should do the cylinder change. Okay, so let's see how that cross purge feature can be integrated into other manifolds. Here's the simplest manifold of all, the protocol station. Here are your cross purge valves, your purge gas inlet, purge gas isolation or purge gas inlet valve, your high pressure vent valve, and here is your high pressure isolation. This space right here and this flex hose this flex hose connects to the cylinder over here. Basically, you purge this whole space out, cycle purge it, before you do the cylinder change over here. Get that out of there, just like you did over here. Put your new cylinder on, send a couple slugs out your vent. Close your vent, you're off and running. There's the, there's the cross purge feature on the protocol station. And then here's a more complex manifold, but look at this. Here's the cross purge feature here. So your pigtails here, your cylinders over here, and these, the purge gas inlet, your high pressure isolation, your high pressure vent, use them to cycle purge the area, clear it out of the hazardous gas, and now you're basically doing cylinder change out in a safe way. All right, the cabinet. The cabinet is an important part of handling cylinders safely. So this cabinet right here looks like a lot of cabinets that you may be familiar with, but it has some very key features. One is it's a nice sturdy 12 gauge cold rolled metal. It's got an automatic door closure so that when you're done doing whatever you're doing inside of that cabinet, it closes automatically, keeping that hazardous gas in there. It's got a sprinkler head. So if you've got a flammable gas, so you have a fire in that cabinet, the water's gonna come on, put that fire out. You gotta restrain your cylinder. You can't afford it falling out of the cabinet. Here's a strap for an inert gas like nitrogen, argon, CO, maybe a not so dangerous CO2 or oxygen or that sort of thing. You wanna have locks on your cabinet. Here's a lock on the access panel. Here's a lock on the door. 
the threshold needs to be modest. You're going to move that heavy cylinder over that. You're going to keep control of the cylinder. You can't be lifting it up five or six inches. One inch is about right. And then you need to have air coming in the cabinet, going up the exhaust. Air comes in here, pulls up here with your exhaust system. The fan up there draws it up there. You need to achieve these flow rates in order to get 200 foot per minute across this opening when you're working through it. That makes your system compliant with Article 80 of the Uniform Fire Code. All right, here are some other safety specific features. Your gas is flammable, corrosive, or toxic, add a chain as well as the strap. If your gas is a flammable and you've got a fire inside that cabinet, add a fusible link. This is like a guillotine right here. Basically, it sits up here over the inlet of the air. And if a fire occurs, this fuse senses the temperature, drops the guillotine, blocking air and the oxygen in air from adding to the fire. If you've got an exhaust fail, that's a real problem. You need to have a switch in the exhaust stack that tells you my exhaust system has failed. I need to shut my system down. It'll send a signal to this right here, this controller. And if you need a visual, which is always a good thing, well, have a gauge up here, a magnahelic. It's gonna tell you if you've got sufficient vacuum in that exhaust stack. Now, again, we're focused here on safety, and these are features that are safety specific. If you want to learn more about gas cabinets, use this QR code right here, and you can go to a 30 minute webinar all about gas cabinets. And you'll learn a lot about that, and you'll find it, you should find it very valuable. Okay, the controller. This is an important safety feature because what it does is it takes sensors are inputs from sensors that tell it something's wrong and then it closes this valve right here this ESO valve that's on the high pressure side of your system its whole purpose in life is either let this valve stay open or close it if everything's fine it will the air that it meters to this valve that comes in the top it will let that air flow to the valve opening it if something goes wrong, like maybe a forklift broke a line downstream and you've got an excess flow condition, or gas is detected in the enclosure or in the room or in an area where the gas shouldn't be, that'll send a signal here, a warning, and then a shutoff. Or you can work with a controller that monitors multiple gas detector sensors, and then the controller will send those signals to this controller. Maybe your building's on fire. Well, you need to know that. It will land right here at this alarm. All those things cut off air to the ESO valve, so you don't have to run to the cabinet, open the access hatch, close the cylinder valve, a very time-consuming process. It just shuts off the gas on the high-pressure side of the system. That's what you want. Okay. Portable gas leak detection is important as well. You have fixed detection that I talked about in the prior slide, but you need to combine that with portable. Here are three very common types, very useful types. This one right here looks for the semiconductor gases, the electronic gases, silane, HCl, chlorine, boron trichloride, that sort of thing. For the gas you're looking for, it's looking for a resistance change across a wire that tells you what part per million or concentration of that gas you have in the area. So the hot wire type. Here's another one that's very useful for analytical labs, places where you use hydrogen, like gas chromatography bays. All right, so you choose a group that says, oh, I'm looking for hydrogen, and it's going to see, okay, I've got a thermal conductivity associated with hydrogen. That's what I've got in the area. It also will look for helium, one of the few detectors to look for helium. So if you've got a system and you want to know if it's leaking or not, you might put some helium in there. And if that helium is seeping across a fitting, this detector will pick it up. And then here's the old classic standby, the bubble liquid solution. You basically put the 
liquid on the fitting. And if you see bubbles, you've got a leak. However, keep in mind, although this is a very good type of leak detection system to have, it doesn't do as well as these more sophisticated types. You could have a leak and not be able to tell with the bubble solution. You need something more sophisticated to know if you got a very small leak. All right, now here is something you should know about if you're not aware of the sample pump gas detector technology. Here's a pump. Here are glass tubes. You put the tube for the gas you wanna detect in this example, ammonia. Put that tube in there, break off the ends, and now you draw the air into the pump. The amount of the gas you're looking for or concerned about will show up as a stain on the paper inside that tube. You can detect rooms, factories, outdoor fence lines, and see what's coming across an area that you need to be aware of with the sample pump type detector. And it pretty much, you have tubes for virtually every gas out there. All right, I wanna talk about these specific safety related valves. One, the excess flow valve. Doesn't require a controller or wires or anything. It's a mechanical device. At a given pressure, if you have a certain flow that's higher than what should be going on at that flow, this thing will close the flow path. Gas goes through it like that. And until you fix that condition, then it's not gonna allow you to flow gas. To reset it, you just use this knob up here. Very simple device, but very good safety feature to have in your system. Here, I wanna talk about a check valve integrated in a cylinder connection. It's gonna be inside here, allowing gas to go one way through this cylinder connection. Here's a good look at this cylinder connection at the end of a flex hose. It only allows gas to go in your flex hose one way. Why is that important? Because a lot of the gases we use are high pressure, maybe up to 2,400 PSI. And if your system is charged on the high pressure side, 2,400 PSI, and you don't have a check valve here, and you disconnect the cylinder or someone does, if you don't have this flex hose restrained, it's gonna whip around the same way a garden hose does when water is coming out of the spigot on a garden hose that's lying in the lawn. Think about it, 2,400 PSI whipping a steel flex hose around. It could kill you. So put a check valve in the CGA connection if the gas is appropriate for a check valve. All right, here are standalone check valves, both brass and stainless, just showing you how it looks as a standalone item. It can be in your system, Elsewhere from the flex hose, again, gas can only go one way. It can't come back the other way. Flash arresters. If you have a flammable gas, you should put one of these in there, like hydrogen, acetylene, methane, even oxygen, which of course does bad things with fire and can uh, help a system catch fire. If the gas has gone this way downstream uh, and you have this flash arrestor on the low pressure side of your manifold and a fire should happen down here, it could travel back down towards your, your panel, your regulator, your cylinder. This item right here snuffs it out. Doesn't allow that fire to make it through this system. We have them in brass, stainless, and for high purity systems, we even have flash arresters with VCR connections. All right, you need to know the gas that you're dealing with. Okay, we're all familiar with hydrogen. It ranks a four, a top rating in flammability. However, it's not considered overly problematic for health and reactivity. And it's light, so if it leaks, it's gonna go up, up and away, even through cracks in your roof, if it can find them. Carbon dioxide, it's got a little, it's got a one in the health area. The big risk with, with carbon dioxide is it's gonna displace oxygen. And if you walk in a room without oxygen, you're gonna keel over very quickly. 
it doesn't have a high rating and it doesn't have a rating at all in flammability and reactivity because it doesn't uh, catch fire and it's not reactive. Helium, it's got a zero in all categories and it also likes to go up, up and away. So the only risk it has is displacing oxygen. And if your room is not contained or small, it's gonna be difficult for helium to cause that problem. But helium is, helium is expensive. You don't wanna lose, lose helium at a leak. Okay, restraining your cylinder. I mentioned the strap for, for restraining a cylinder inside a cabinet. A lot of cylinders like nitrogen, argon, helium are installed and put in process outside the cabinet. You need, it needs to be restrained against the wall with a strap. The gas is hydrogen, a toxic, maybe hydrogen chloride. Well, hydrogen chloride should be in a cabinet unless it's outdoors. Uh, let's say it's flammable like hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide. You need a, a restraint as well, a chain restraint. And if inside hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane really ought to be in a cabinet as well. But chain with the strap for those gases. The small cylinder stand, say you're doing something on a bench top. Bolt that bent, that uh, stand onto your bench top. Use the set screws to keep the cylinder in place. And now it's safe to run your gas to whatever you're doing with it. Cylinders that have arrived need to be stored prior to use or after they're empty, supposedly empty and ready to leave the facility. Store them in a rack with two restraints per cylinder. Here's a four cylinder, here's a two cylinder rack. Maybe you need to use those cylinders out in the middle of a factory. You've got a concrete pad. Well, bolt that freestanding rack to the concrete pad. Put your cylinders in place. Use the cylinder restraints that are right here. Secure them. And maybe your regulator is put up here. And now you can do your work safely. You've got control of your cylinders. Use a freestanding rack. Even outdoors on a concrete pad, use a freestanding rack. Moving cylinders, in the old days, they used to roll them down the hall. Not anymore. You use a cylinder hand truck. Here's a one cylinder. Here's a two, like that, with cylinder restraints up here. But look at this. These hand trucks have a wheel. So they have four wheels. That example in that earlier slide, that gentleman had a dolly, a two-wheeled dolly. Not sufficient. You need a nice stable base. Get a hand truck with four wheels. All right, here is possibly the most overlooked item you need in dealing with cylinders, the wrenches. You need a universal wrench for CGA connections. That's what this one is. For cylinders that come with a plug in the outlet valve, you need an Allen wrench for cylinders that don't have a hand wheel. Certain gases don't have a hand wheel. You need a square wrench. And then possibly the best wrench of all is the award-winning blue hand wheel wrench. This picture pretty much tells you what it can do. Cylinder caps are problematic, especially those that have rust on them. This blue wrench will get that cap off without too much energy expended by you. And cylinder valves are difficult to move, especially when they're fully open or fully closed. This blue wrench will get that cylinder hand wheel to move as well. All right, Matheson has produced publications for dealing with gases safely, and here they are. There's the, um, the effects of exposure to topic gas, toxic gases right here, and a guide to safe handling of compressed gases. These could be useful, especially if you have new employees coming in into your factory or facility. It might be a good way to get them exposed to how to handle dangerous gases. And you can find these at this link right here. All the items we discussed are at this link below the QR code. So what did we accomplish today? We learned about equipment that helps you handle hazardous gases safely. And we learned about the resources and support that we can provide to you.
we are at the question and answer portion of this event. Bill, could you join, please? Uh, yes, Dave, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, first question submitted by the audience. Please provide expertise on how to safely use flammable gases in the lab for cryogenic electron microscopy. Typical gases are ethane, hydrogen, and oxygen. Please address cylinders in use, not cylinders in storage. Uh, that's a good question, Dave. There's a lot of answers to that. Um, start with whenever you install equipment and oxygen service, make sure that, that it is what is called clean for oxygen service, uh, typically the CGA 4.1 guidelines. Uh, sometimes people overlook that and then they'll have an oxygen fire. So it's important to have uh, the equipment they're using for oxygen clean for oxygen service. A fixed gas detection system is good to have as it can tell you when there is a flammable gas leak. An excess flow valve or an excess flow switch coupled with a controller and ESO valve will protect you from an excessive leak if your process piping breaks. Flash arresters should be used in oxygen or hydrogen systems when there is a chance of a flame downstream of your equipment. When you're venting flammable gases, you want to make sure that the uh, vent line goes to a safe area and you don't want to have it vent out in the room or uh, could cause an explosion. And of course, cylinders need to be properly restrained. Thank you. Here's the next question. I have a hydrogen system and want to install a flash arrestor. Where should I install the flash arrestor? Thank you, Dave. You should install a flash arrestor downstream of any equipment that you want to protect because any anything downstream of the flash arrestor might get uh, burned up if there's a flashback event. Okay, thank you. So if your system has a regulator, that's the final part of the system, you would install it right after the regulator, correct? Uh, correct. And if you have other devices like an excess flow valve you know, or something else, you want to have it downstream of the excess flow valve. Okay, thank you. How exactly does the fusible link feature of a gas cabinet work? Uh, thanks, Dave. Uh, a metal plate is held above the inlet air louver to a gas cabinet. When the temperature inside the cabinet rises to 165 degrees Fahrenheit, the fusible link melts and the plate drops down and blocks air from entering the cabinet. A video of a fusible link can be found on the gas cabinet product page in our online store and can also be found on the Matheson Specialty Gas Equipment YouTube channel. Thank you. All right, how do I get rusted cylinder caps off of my cylinder? Our TW5 cylinder hand wheel wrench is a great tool to remove rusted cylinder caps and can also be used to help open cylinder valves. Thank you. All right, we have some questions. First one, how should six packs be restrained? You wanna have them on a flat surface and you might need to chalk the wheels so they don't roll. Yeah, Bill, uh, from my experience too, I understand six packs, although technically stable, they can tip like a, like a 12 pack. It's gonna be a little more of a square. My understanding is a six pack can tip. I is there? Um, do you have any any comment on that? Well, you need to have it secured, maybe wedged wedged into an area where it won't tip over. Okay. The next question for gas detectors: What is the frequency of calibration when you using carbon monoxide, methane, and hydrogen? You know, it's interesting. A lot of gas detection places kind of dance around this. People typically will get them done uh, every year. And, th and they'll say that uh, it depends on the what use it's in. Because if you get a lot of, uh, you know, gas leaks, you might need to calibrate more often than, than not. But mm -hmm. people typically do it on a yearly basis. Some people do it on every six months. Yeah, yeah. But it depends on your use, so. Okay, and I know from my experience with selling our gas detection product line, that oftentimes, even though sensors come out of the factory calibrated, it's always good practice to calibrate right away. You install the system and then confirm it is in fact working as it should. Okay. Agree with that? All right, it can't hurt to calibrate it right off, uh, right when you get it, just to make sure. Okay, here's a question. Where can I find the storage cabinet webinar? I believe it's on our gas cabinet product page on our online store, but we also have the uh, Matheson Specialty Gas Equipment Tech Support YouTube channel, and we've got a section there on uh, webinars. 
And we've got the gas cabinets on there. We got regulators. I think we did one on rotometers. And switchovers too, I believe. Go to the online store in the help center. You got a direct link to the YouTube channel. The next question, are there guidelines, NFPA, et cetera, when flame arresters should be used? You know, I'm not an expert on the NFPA guidelines, but people will typically use it if they if there's a hazard with a, a flame downstream. And there's pressure ratings too for the gases. Do you suggest using a ramp for getting the cylinder over the one inch ledge into the gas cabinet? Yeah, that's a good question. We don't sell a ramp for that. We, we, we sell ramps for scales, but the one inch is pretty low. So it's quite easy to get it up over. So in general, no, you just, no. It's, no. You, you tip it up and over. Yeah, but you, like, right. exactly with a scale, we do have a ramp that accompanies the scales that go inside. Yeah, scale, scales are much higher. I don't see any other questions. Thank, thank you very much for joining us. And again, thank you for joining us. Thanks and bye.